asking that you prevent the forces that would confuse, interfere, and interrupt, that they are not able to do so. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. That which I want to cover first this afternoon, you will for a little while wonder what I'm doing and why. But you remember this morning I mentioned that this very thing we are exposing and showing is not only somebody going and getting a particular medical therapy for something, it's a part of a bigger program, a part of the devil's design to change the world view of people. If they feel they have improved with the therapy, then they begin to believe that what is explained as its origin and its power and the devil's influence begins to bring a changing worldview from that of a Judeo-Christian to accepting some of the Eastern pantheistic viewpoint. In fact, the book The Aquarian Conspiracy, written by Marilyn Ferguson, which is sort of the New Age Bible written in 1980, it says that's exactly why they use these various therapies, because to change that worldview to be into this new neo-pagan movement. And so there's a lot, this is a lot deeper than just, well, that wasn't a good thing to use for your health. It's, it's deeper than that. We're looking at something that uh, is a part of a design to bring again the world uh, toward a pantheistic viewpoint and a one world system and one world religion for those final events. And it's my belief we're in the middle of it from what I have studied. So let us proceed here with what we have today. The Babylonian mysteries in the Christian civilization. I want to show you how these deceptions that started in ancient Babylon, the false story of creation and the very premises upon which it was built not only has been carried on since that time in the pagan civilizations, the nature worship, mind you, but it's been in the Christian civilization in a disguised form that most people have not been aware of. And that is what I want to show you. So you, if you see something, you wonder why I'm doing it and maybe you shouldn't be showing that, Wait till we get to the end before you make your final uh, conclusion on that. Here we read, we read earlier today, For once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. 2 Corinthians, For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? <clears throat> the pagan civilization, its medical doctrine, they practice based on the astrology and dualism. Everything was, has its origin out of this association, correspondence, sympathy between the planets, earth and man in this uh, line of thought. The doctrine of vital force, cosmic force, the imbalance as the cause of disease. And it's interesting throughout the history of medicine, whenever man has finally found the true origin of the cause of certain diseases, those almost always can be dealt with. But up to then, all sorts of treatments and terrible results, usually worse than better, were the results when the idea of what caused the disease wasn't understood. And we'll be emphasizing that in a certain way a little later. Health maintained by following Jehovah's laws. God gave in the days of Israel 
in the desert. He gave public health laws that are the standards of our public health of today. This very principles that was outlined. And if you go to the history books for medicine throughout the ages, they'll take certain civilizations and show what a certain civilization had to add to the knowledge of medicine in time. And the Jewish civilization was different than all of the rest. It's the only one that taught prevention, even to this day. We're beginning to get a little of it. They're changing. But that was the basis of God's information to them, the prevention. And so applying the prevention even to the illness many times was effective. And so God gave information as to the diet, to the hygiene in the Exodus. The information uh, given was for the prevention of disease and is the fundamentals of public health today. The Hebrew nation, they believed in a creator God. The health was, was attained by following God's spiritual and physical laws. When they were in harmony, they were blessed. If you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will give, will do that which is right in his sight and give ear to the commandments, to his commandments, keep all of his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. You are familiar with that verse. Remember, they came to a place where there was bitter water. They cut a bush. Moses cut a bush, threw it in the water. It became sweet. And this statement was made at, after that event. For 70 years, they remained in captivity in the city of uh, Babylon in, and in the realm of Babylon. After 70 years, they returned, some of them returned to Israel. And following that return, there was a secret society found just when it came about, when it was formed, is not known. But even in the Spirit of Prophecy, it mentions they brought back with them some of the religion of, of the uh, Zoroasterism that they attained in old Babylon. And there was a mixture, there was a loss in their purity of their religion. I just read that recently. But we know from a secular viewpoint that the granddaddy of secret societies, known as the Kabbalah, it's not so secret anymore, but it formed in Israel and was there down through time. Now, I'm not here to, on just the subject of the secret societies. I'm going to want to show you how through them certain doctrines have been brought on down through time through the Christian society. Uh, civilization, and it has to do with this therapies of these uh, alternative therapies that we're talking about. So they returned after 70 years. The Kabbalah was found. It was formed by combining mysticisms of Babylon, Judaism, and Zoroasterism, and it promoted mystical healing practices based on dualism. Remember the yin yang, the right left, the positive negative. And so dualism is involved here and the mystical healing properties. <clears throat> there is the official insignia of the Kabbalah. I just showed that for interest. Now, what is their doctrine? The key, they are considered the key of the occult sciences. They were the granddaddy of the secret societies down through time. Their doctrine of theosophy mystical insight of God, how to have a direct connection with God without using his scriptures, mind you, is that. The magical system of healing, and we'll look at some of those. Actually, if you look at the right-hand corner down there is certain alphabet letters that are arranged for a healing purpose. Mystical arrangements of numbers, pronouncement of the ineffable name, wearing of omelets and talismans, and use of certain mineral compounds were a part of their health and healing thing. There is a talisman that would be put at the head of a newborn child to prevent illness. And so we have numbers, we have letters, and we have figures and symbols, all of this in a mystical way to prevent illness. Another one, 
There's a different type of an arrangement. If you are newly married, somebody will uh, make a bowl and then they will paint in there a lot of letters, numbers, uh, all sorts of things and give that to the new marriage couple, new married couple, and that's to promote health, longevity, and happiness in the home. So again, a mystical thing coming out of the Kabbalah. There is a city called Safat in Israel. It's about 15 miles north of Lake Galilee in the hills. My wife and I were driving, and we had a rental car, and we were driving through the country there some years ago. And I saw the sign, the sign pointed up a hill, the home of the Kabbalah. Ha! Ah, I says, we're going up there. <laughs> and uh, so we up there, and this is, uh, let me go back here. This is a, uh, uh, what is the name? Palestinian city. It's not a Jewish city, but it has a Jewish section. And it's an old town. In fact, it was hit by rockets pretty heavily from out of uh, the country north of there some t not too long back. And down one of the side streets that leads us into the Jewish section, and then my wife and I, we walked through here, and going into the Jewish section, which was the home of the Kabbalah, we see a sign there that says, do not take pictures on the Sabbath. But there, we weren't there on the Sabbath, so we took pictures. <laughs> and it's an ancient setting, very interesting. I ran into one of the instructors, a teacher of the Kabbalah, and I'm busy at asking his permission to take his picture, and he's telling me no. But my wife's taking the picture, so she didn't wait for the answer on that part. An old uh, synagogue, an ancient synagogue there. Very interesting history of this, but that isn't my point. My point is Kabbalah is the granddaddy, the Gnostics. We heard of the Gnosticism, right? The first part of Christianity, Gnosticism, gave Christianity a bad time infiltrating and causing uh, wrong doctrines and so forth. And Gnostics were born of the Kabbalist. Remember this purpose of this is to oppose God's plan of salvation. And the Gnostics attempted to do that. Remember Simon Magus, there in Acts, the founder of Gnosticism? He's the one that asked, wanted to pay Peter some money to have the power given to him so he could put his hands on people and bless them and give them the Holy Spirit, too. He was known as the founder of Gnosticism, practitioner of mystic, mystical healing. Now, it was based in pantheism, nature worship, and deification of humanity. He became sorcerer to Nero. And Nero made a statue of him, placed it along the river next to Rome, and I'm told that that's the statue now that has been told is Peter. And people look to it as Peter, but it was really Simon Magus in those days. This first century of Christianity spread to the then known world. Simon Magnus, he requests power from Peter. He forms Gnosticism, and the Gnostics infilled Christianity, and it caused confusion. The book, one of the official books of the Masonic Order, Morals and Dogma, by Albert Pike, states that the reference book, this book, Morals and Dogma, has 40 pages on the Gnostics and its relationship to the Freemasonry. Now, my point is not dealing just with Freemasonry. I want to show that through the organizations, the doctrine that the Eastern religions carried is carried on and brought into the Western civilization. Eventually, they come together. But that's so keep your mind that I'm not trying to just do in or expose secret societies. I want to show where this type of message came through. All right, here we look at the top one, the Kabbalah. Then there was Gnosticism, these organizations. And from these many, many, many little side organizations and secret societies formed, Manichaeism was in the second and third century. Various Islamic secret societies when they had the Crusades. And then the Knights Templar went there to be uh, oppose the uh, Muslim movement 
Then many of those got involved into the secret societies of the Muslims in Egypt and so forth, and then they came back to Europe bringing with them uh, not Catholicism, but the, the mysticism of those secret societies. And those were the Knights Templars. Then there was the Rosicrucians, still today, and Freemasonry. Those are the main big ones that carried a certain doctrine, propagating it down through the Christian society of the Western world. And what is, what is their basic? And it's Luciferian occultism controls Freemasonry. Luciferian occultism is therefore not a novelty, but it bore a different name in the early days of Christianity. It was called Gnosticism, and its founder was Simon the Magician. Okay, it subverted Christianity for 2,000 years. The goal was to pervert Christianity and healing is the right arm method to attract people to theosophy. Theosophy, the mysticism of God, and the connection with God is the teaching, and the healing, the right arm healing, is to bring people that, in that direction. And it promoted Luciferic worship in a very disguised form. This is a chart that is, makes it easy for you to see what I've been attempting to say. You find up here at the top, ancient mystery religions out of Babylon, and from there, for, of Babylon to Egypt, to India, Persia, Greece, and around the world was this basic doctrine of the beginning the, of the false story of creation and the doctrine of divinity within. That's the most important thing to remember, divinity within. Each individual was a part of God. And it came then down on the Western civilization through those different organizations. Over there to your left is where you have paganism and witchcraft and all of the things that came out of that. And as you see, coming down through time, through these organizations, and then here down in our day, the New Age movement, they come together. And then below it, you see the words East and West. And that's what you will see Today is called East-West. Coming there at the Freemasonry level and the Illuminati, this would be at the time starting about the French Revolution. There's some chapters in Great Controversy that will give you a lot of understanding of what went on at that point. And that's when then uh, there was a change as it came to there and we had the French Revolution, some more changes occurred and let's take a look there. The theology there was based on the dualism, good and evil. Lucifer is the god of light. Adonai, Jesus, god of darkness, promotes Luciferic worship by use of signs and symbols. Healing practices used to attract people to theosophy doctrine. Remember Mrs. White speaks about theosophy being spiritualism. For in her day, she mentioned this in for sure was a component of spiritualism. But we're having here, following down through and coming, we're coming to our day is the purpose of showing this. Now, the French Revolution was a reign of terror for three and a half years, but, uh, and that was found in Revelation 11, the prediction of that event, and there's a chapters in the Great Controversy that relate to it and help you, if you haven't read those, help you understand what went on at that time. And at that time, this atheistic, spiritualistic um, revolution or movement came forward that caused such disturbance in France and led by the secret society, especially the Masonic Lodge known as the Grand Orient. And that, there was 150 lodges there that were involved in that. Napoleon came on the scene. He suppressed this total uh, unrest, the the terrible disturbance that occurred in France and Paris, he took over, pushed that down, and then it went underground. It went in secret, other societies formed. And this atheistic, spiritistic movement that lost control of the government for after three and a half years, it moved into many secret organizations, became a worldwide movement, humanism, socialism, communism, many others, 
I have a chart from 1922 that shows a vast number of organizations. So the basic doctrine, the basic dogma that had been carried down through time now spread out in different organizations throughout the world. And humanism is a big one we have now in socialism, but they had their origin out of this. And the doctrine of spiritualism, theosophy, this comes from book education, page 227, 228, that men are unfallen demigods, little gods is what that's saying, that each mind will judge itself. Remember I read this morning that list that showed the uh, various aspects of spiritualism other than sitting around a seance table? This was the uh, thing. This, and then here's the statement that was so important to me. The worldwide dissemination of the teaching that led to the French Revolution all are tending to involve the whole world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France. Now, if you wonder what's happening in your government and all of the rioting going on and these uh, progressives and these ones that are creating havoc, Here's your answer, it's just beginning. That the worldwide, this will be the cover of the world at the end of time. It's come down through the societies and here we're coming to where it's going to fulfill and once again show its ugly head. Now, a leader back in the late 1800s, Madame Blavatsky and Henry Wolcott, they formed the, the Theosophy Theosophy Society in New York. And Mrs. White speaks about this society, says it's spiritualism. The leader uh, was actually influenced for 150 years, greatly influenced the occult activities of the world. Prior to that, back in the seven, late 1700s, there was a person by the name of Swedenborg that for two centuries was the leader of occultism throughout the world. And she sort of followed his place. She influenced Hitler greatly uh, in this field. And she was a, had spent time in Tibet and had been given her message by ascended masters by spirit world. So this is all coming through there. She formed in New York in 1875 a spiritualistic type movement. And it was pantheistic in its nature. And they went secret for 100 years, and in 1975, they came out, and in the United States, they were all celebrating in 1975. And that was the beginning of the New Age movement, as we have the neo-pagan movement. Now, what I'm trying to show is that which I'm exposing, these variety of treatments, are nothing but the, the fingers of a greater movement that's wanting to bring together the world under a one-world religion, so that there can be that final conflict when they are against those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. It's a, it's a much bigger thing than just, well, that's not good to do that treatment. It's joining in and being Satan's agent as we partake of it or as we teach it. So this new age movement, as we call it, and that is based in astrology. The very word comes out of us, astrological belief, new, new age. They felt every 2,000 years there's a new change and they were looking forward to the period of Aquarius. So the New Age movement there. Let's move a little faster. Then when Madame Blavatsky passed away, a lady by the name of Annie Bassant took her place. They were members of the Masonic Order in France. There they had women's lodges. Then when Annie Bassant disappeared, Alice Bailey came on the scene and that's more direct what we, in our day, and she received by dictation from spirit guides, she wrote 24 books, which are the foundational books for the recent neo-pagan movement in this country and around the world. The New Age movement is the initiator and leader of mystical healing teaching. And it's, that, it's out of that movement that we begin to see the acupuncture, the meditation, the yoga, and all of these things coming out was out of this movement around the world. And so what I've attempted to do is to have you see a greater picture than, well, that's just not a good thing to do to go get the treatment with acupuncture. It's a part of a bigger thing, and we don't want to be a part of that. That's my, my point. To my office came this magazine. 
Psychology of Channeling, New Age magazine. That's a very expensive magazine, thick, and it only had treatments and so forth uh, involved in this. There was no other type of thing in it. There was no advertisement for anything other than gadgets for doing their healing mechanisms. I wondered where it came from. It didn't identify or anything. It kept coming month after month. And eventually it changed its name to East West. Remember I talked about when those from the pagan group came with the, the ones for the secret societies come together, East West. And so now the journal is called East West and what they're doing is promoting these types of therapies. Acupuncture, radiology, reflexology, a whole host of things. And I couldn't figure out where they came from. Who was supplying them free to my office? And then I got a book, got a hold of a little book that in this book had this particular page, which is a letter from the, the uh, Masonic order. Uh, an individual found the address, sent, and he wanted to advertise in their journal. And they wrote back a letter saying, we don't take advertisements. So it identified unequivocally who had been sending this journal to my office free of charge. The Supreme Council of the uh, Masonic Order. The headquarters for Oregon is about a half mile from my office on this. So that ties it in and showing that this isn't something just spontaneously happening without any sort of an organization. The devil has led it down through time, so it's here today. There are many who shrink with horror from the thought of consulting spirit mediums, but who are attracted by more pleasing forms of spiritism, such as the Emmanuel movement. Anybody know here of the Emmanuel movement of the 1800s or early 19? That was named because the it was a mind-treating type of thing. It was uh, started out in a church called the Emmanuel Church, and so that became the Emmanuel movement. And about the same time, the Christian scientists were starting and becoming popular. So by more pleasing forms of spiritism, such as the Emmanuel movement, still others led astray by the teachings of Christian science, by the mysticism of theosophy, and other oriental religions. Now, does it make more sense what I've been trying to bring together here, she recognized that theosophy, which we've shown came down out of the secret organizations, and it combines with the, and it's the same basic doctrine as the Eastern religions. They're no different. Uh, you wouldn't recognize that till you find out the fundamentals. And now they come together to begin to bring the last scenes upon this earth. A power from beneath is working to bring about the last great scenes in the drama. Satan coming as Christ and working with all deceivableness in those who are blind, binding themselves together. Where? Secret societies. That's why I say, wait till the end before you make your conclusion on this presentation. Because she recognized the source. And what we've done is just trace it in history. Secret associations today, the mysteries of heathen worship are replaced by secret associations and seances and obscurities and wonders of spiritualistic mediums. The disorders, disclosures of these mediums are eagerly received by thousands who refuse to accept light from God's word or through his spirit. Believers in spiritualism may speak with scorn of the magicians of old but the great deceiver laughs in triumph as they yield to his arts under a different form. I mentioned previously that just changing names on things, wow, what differences we can have. And people accept them. A very, now I'm going to read a, a quotation from a man that's a believer in the secret society. He's a promoter of them, and he's outlining for us their purpose. A very important work of the secret societies is, has always been the ultimate unification of world religions. Were you aware of that? This aim was based on the restoration of the pre-Christian mystery traditions, ancient Babylon, which had been persecuted by the early church, forced to go underground in medieval Europe, 
and the recognition that all religions had originated in a universal spirituality referred to as the ancient wisdom. That would be that which came out of ancient Babylon, that foundation we spoke of earlier today. It forms, he's speaking about this, uh, this um, society, it forms the basis for the ancient Egyptian mysteries, that ancient wisdom. Gnosticism, esoteric Christianity, the Kabbalah, the Hermetic tradition, alchemy, the societies and such as the Templars, Freemasons, Rosicrucians, the occult doctrines of Geomancy, alchemy, astrology and sexual magic taught by these secret societies were used as symbolic metaphors, illustrating the progression of the individual from material darkness to the spiritual light of understanding. Now we turn to the Bible, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. They are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And I saw three unclean spirits, let's read it again, like frogs. They are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and who and where else of the whole world to gather to the battle of the great day of God Almighty, that Armageddon battle. And that concludes that particular presentation. But I present this uh, knowing that sometimes it's going to be misunderstood and uh, felt not have its place. But when we understand what I'm showing here, it gives us a stronger foundation to believe that what is happening is a part of the devil's design to bring about those final events in the world's history. And then for us to realize we're right in the middle of it. It's not tomorrow. It's not a future. It's now and behind us, part of it. And so with that, let us turn to the next presentation. And it's going to be on the meditation, yoga, uh, that type of thing to give us an understanding, a little more understanding of what that is. So if you would go ahead and give me that particular number four. Just to ask a question, is this information relatively new to you? Or have you heard any of this before? My father talked to us about Your father talked to you about on, on these societies. Mm -hmm. All right, let us proceed. Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of this country and all the wisdom of Egypt. Where did Solomon get his understanding? From God, didn't he? He requested wisdom, and God gave him wisdom. And when he had that, then the kings of the earth came to him because they heard of his wisdom from the God of the universe, the creator God, the one that created by the breath of his mouth. And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth, which had heard of his wisdom. this to move there we are for you have forsaken your people we read that this morning the house of Jacob because they are filled with eastern ways we're talking today about eastern ways they are soothsayers like the Philistines and they are pleased with the children of foreigners hmm. Not there. so the religions of the east the doctrines and the goals what is the origin the origin was that story of false creation of a blending of a two-part universal energy. And their purpose then is to discover godhood. The basic purpose of a Hindu is to, to come into realization of his godhood. All of his life is spent in raising his 
itself by manipulating in one form or another the so-called energy that is flow th supposed to flow through his body to bring him up into that level of godhood and to escape reincarnation, to join the spirit world of nirvana. Origin explained by astrology, this creative principle, the one, the self, the ultimate unified energy field consciousness, those variety of synonyms referring to that, that force that is believed in. The manifest universe can be seen as the play of two great antagonistic forces which continually create, sustain, and destroy all that exists in the universe. Remember those five planets that I showed you of the Chinese, uh, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, um, the other one, supposedly are, are the ones continuing the creation and the destruction and, and fulfilling this particular concept that is presented here. But in that, the creative principle, the one, the self, self is running through me. When they speak of my consciousness, that's supposedly that energy, that energy that has all the knowledge of the universe, those seven levels of the energy will move on in those extra uh, bodies. Now, the intelligence, speaking of that power, this word intelligence referring to the same power that operates the cosmos, which governs migration and seasons, orbits, the planets also operates the level of human physiology, the sole function of Ayurveda, that's the name of the medical system of the ancient uh, Hindus and uh, in India, is to promote the flow of intelligence through man. The whole purpose is to move that presumed energy, that presumed power, cosmic force, through the body in an efficient manner. The whole religious activities of the Hindu is gained, aimed at that one particular thing. The Ayurveda concept, the disease is a result of an imbalance of energy. Now, for thousands of years, that's the way inner, uh, disease has been dealt with in India and in China. And what was the end result? One of the worst physical conditions of countries in the world, outside of some of the African places. It didn't work. It wasn't the cause of disease. And it, was, it led to nothing but disaster. And the, the basis of all treatments in, the, in that system is the balancing of life energies within us. So meditation, yoga, are an intricate part of that. Satan concept, health and healing involves the balancing of the energy. Remember? You can, this helps us remember the concept. Now, this concept went to Tibet, China, Japan, Indonesia, and in the east, then in the 11th century to Persia and Arabia, Europe in the Middle Ages, the medical practice of the United States in the 17 and early 1800s was basically guided by a lot of these concepts. It was a little different, but it had the background was similar. The medical practice there, as we mentioned, uh, was based on that. The popular in the West in the 70s. We got out of that, and now it's been brought back in to us. So looking at this system of health and healing that was in the Hindu um, religion, meditation is the fundamental aspect. That is, it, all of the rest depend upon a meditation. And what is meditation? Sitting and thinking? No. It's emptying the mind, getting the mind to not think. That's the whole project. It's a process of stopping the thinking process. And unfortunately, in English, we have the one word for the meditation where your mind is active, thinking on God, the beta rhythm of the brain, and then we have meditation for the alpha rhythm where we're trying to empty it. When I was speaking and presenting this in Russia, they only have one word, and you don't use meditation because they translate it in a, for only the occultic, and it really confuses things. And unfortunately, we have that. Now, yoga means to unite, and that the object is to unite with that universal energy, that god of Brahma, Brahma, the god of the Hindu, that thing, that's the whole purpose. And the exercises we'll get into a little more that are so common in the churches and the thinking, these are wonderful for health, um, is a part of this. Meditation is the fundamental beginning, and then there is a certain type of diet they do, and a certain way of using herbs, mineral substances, it's a certain type of massage, with essential oils. Now, regular Swedish massage, I'm not putting that down. That's excellent. But 
this type of thinking has pretty well captivated all of the part across the country and physical therapists to add these other things to it. And you can hardly go any place anymore without having to fight off they wanting to do some of these occultic practices with it. And that's unfortunate. Uh, aromas uh, and the essential oils are part of this. Uh, cleansing of the systems, this cleansing of toxins comes out of this uh, part. Let's go ahead a little further here. So we see the yoga being practiced and meditation. Let's come back here, this jumps ahead. There are four essentials in putting the mind at emptiness, at rest, and not thinking. Relaxation of the body. Finding a position of comfort, totally relaxing, starting with the feet and on up through the hands, letting every muscle relax. Then paying attention to the breath in various ways, deep breathing. To bring the mind to passivity using a mantra, repeating a, ver a word or a sentence, even if it's biblical, doesn't matter, over and over, will begin to put that brain at a, and change the rhythm, the electrical rhythm of the brain in from beta to alpha, which is putting it, you can be awake, but it is put it, putting you out of the thinking. It's taken away the thinking from the frontal lobes and the other parts of the brain are functioning. And it takes away your control, your, your inhibitions. And then the positions on the uh, yoga are important. We'll bring that up a little bit later here. These facts that you see there, those four things, uh, Dr. Herbert Benson of Harvard University reviewed back through the history of all religions, and he found these same basic four things as the foundation of the, in these religions, that which had to deal with the mind. Now, he's a Buddhist. And he, what he did, he took those same things that were regular meditation, regular uh, transcendental meditation, and he gave them a different name. He called it relaxation. And it has spread all through the medical field because now we have a different name, but even he himself, it's, it's identical to transcendental meditation, no different. It's the same basic things. And any one of those by itself, any combination of those will work to put the brain at rest. Just even the breathing in, it, in their manner. The positions we'll get into in a little bit, as asanas they're called. This helps you review what we said this morning. You breathe that universal energy through the nose, goes down through these anatomical tubes that don't exist, but mythical tubes that take them to the bottom of the pelvis, and then by the meditation, by yoga, yoga exercises, that energy then is distributed to the tissues of the body, they say, and grows and comes up through the chakras, and when it gets up here, it meets the God of the universe, that cosmic energy, and you have reached your godhood and attained immortality, and you have escaped reincarnation. This is the fundamental of all of the other things that follow. In Newsweek, I have a copy of this with me about a year and a half ago. Newsweek came out with a special issue, and that whole book is filled with the occult, that whole issue. And there it shows on the front page just what we're talking about here. That's quite something for that magazine. They're a leftist one anyhow, but uh, this, this shows they've taken the religion hook, line, and sinker. Now, we have spoke about the chakras and this aura. We'll not dwell more on it here. We showed this this morning, that the end result by meditation, by visualization, and we haven't really talked about that, by the cleansing routine that is initiated for these, quotes toxins, which really is for their sins, cleanse your sins by these methods of irrigating the, the nostrils and so forth. We'll show that in a bit here. But this brings you up into your divine self. That's the object, that's the goal of this whole thing. And now what we have is the yoga and the yoga exercises moving into the church as Christian yoga. I want you to think, is it possible that this is Satan's ground? He's had it for a minimum of 3,500 years, these practices. And never had we thought in before the 70s that these were other than belonged to the pagan world. And now they're in the church. Some in our church and in many churches. 
uh, you know, there's, we have to think about that. What they really are, we're bringing in. You can, it's easy to see what happened back in the second and the third centuries when paganism moved full bore into the church. As we sit in our church during our time, some of those happenings moving right in, it just shocks you when you think about it. The yoga exercise is the purpose to promote, promote the flow of and release of blocked, congested universal energy, to stimulate the activity of the chakras. So the yoga in different positions, and then especially the yoga exercises, are supposed to promote the flow of this energy through to raise the kundalini. Have you heard that term? That means that serpent. That means serpent. Serpent energy. In the base of the body, supposedly all of us have a kundalini latently laying there, which is serpent power. And by the yoga exercises, they're specifically done to do snake-like motions, round moving snake-like motions to raise the kundalini, to activate that latent power, to come up through the body in those manners. And to create spiritual awareness, which means godhood. That's the aim. Serpent power, kundalini. All right, let's take a look and see what happens. Cobra pose. Many of these poses are like snake-like. And they have different names. There we are doing the yoga to the sun, the rising sun. Around the world that is done. Here's the snake. It finally gets up to the top. These are taken out of the drawings from India. I didn't draw these or haven't drawn. What's that? Those are cobras that are making this hood. It's the individual cobra heads that are they're spread out, showing you the belief of the kundalini. There we go. We've seen that one. The goal of meditation and yoga. Now, this is taken from the yoga journal. The means by which the human soul may be completely united with the supreme spirit pervading the universe and thus attain liberation. That comes from a yoga journal. That's the words right out of the horse's mouth, shall we say, that as to its purpose. It isn't my interpretation of it. And this is a comment from you, Let Us Reason Ministries. That's on the internet. This man that writes this had been deep in this for a long time. He came out, become a converted Christian, and he writes, the poses that they so diligently practice in their stretching are named after Hindu gods. And what one is actually doing is calling on them in that worshipful pose, it's calling on the gods. They are bowing and for all intents and purposes worshiping that god. Our god says you're not to bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your god, am a jealous god. So those different poses, and positions they think. Most of them are named after Hindu gods. I'm going to share with you here an, an article that came. He says, um, oh, I grabbed the wrong one. I'll get that a little later. But I have a book called The Buddha Pill. Some psychologists that were working in the penitentiaries in England decided to write a book documenting the scientific proof and evidence of the value of meditation, ex the yoga exercise, and so forth. They were using them in the prisons. And this started maybe three years ago before to write the book. By the time they finished the book, they wrote a book that did just the opposite. They say, we didn't find any scientific proof that it is valuable, that it's good. The one place where there was a placebo used in the yoga the meditation, they could get equal results just sitting in the corner reading a book, being still for a half hour. So, they, And what they did show, and they commented and made a whole chapter on, the ill effects 
of doing these things. Many physical ailments occur. Pain, uh, psychosis, suicide. In fact, one particular gathering for a weekend in California, two-thirds of those that attended had some sort of trauma of that nature of all varying degrees. Some, what? Buddha, this is Buddha Pill. Yes, excellent book. And the thing that I really push is that we cannot participate in these and say, I'm not going to take any of the religious aspect. I'm just going to do them, get the good out of it. And that's a myth. And they say it's a myth. That's what really surprised me. A group that believed in them, promoted them, practicing them, by the time they finished their research says, hey, it's not so. And they wrote seven myths in here. And what, the one that really is outstanding where they have a whole chapter showing the adverse effects of this. And then saying, nobody reports it. They just ignore it, but it's there. I know back in the 70s when Transcendental Meditation was very popular across the country, there was a special crisis center set up uh, across the United States. I think there was 37 or 38 centers with 1,500 professionals manning them for the mental crises and problems happening from those practicing the Transcendental Meditation. This is no easy thing. I had another paper I was going to read, and I picked up the wrong one there to sh share. But it's by a lady that had been 40 years in this. She was head of a, uh, a place for the Buddhist monastery or so forth. And she t came back into Christianity. And she says, you can't, cannot practice these without the influence. You may not know it. You don't intend it. You don't want it. But it'll come. It may come as a pain or physical illness that nobody can diagnose, doesn't get better, they can't do anything for it, all variety of things. Two weeks ago, I was up in northern Washington presenting a seminar of this, and I mentioned this and read that little journal. And I got a call a few days later after I got home from an individual saying, say, we have a friend that is doing the yoga, and she has disorders, pain, that nobody can diagnose or benefit or help. Send us, please, some of your information. This lady, this nun that had been 40 years in it, said the foundation of Hinduism are these postures in the yoga. Part of the foundation. Why? Because early on, she says, the holy men were sitting in different positions, waiting to make contact with Brahma, the head god of the Hindu, and the spirits would show up as gods and put them in different positions, and they're called asanas. We call it posture, but asanas. And those were named after the gods. And so as they do those postures, what this one fellow was telling us, you're calling on that god to possess you. This sounds like I'm really a field, but I'm sharing with you what those that have been in it are telling me. I've never done any of this, so I don't have that personal experience. But it's pretty potent. And we as a people need to know this. And I'm sure your church is not involved in there, but you've heard plenty of what is and where. One of our major churches, I have a, showing a, their um, bulletin, and half a page is promoting uh, uh, similar to the yoga exercise, Tai Chi, in their youth room. And uh, it's Andrews, Pioneer Memorial. I have it in my computer. I have a picture of that. that bulletin. I mean, that's just beginning to give you, make you sick if I told you all I knew. This is a big problem in our church, and it's not being met. I'm the only one I know of around trying to raise, and that's extremely difficult. But it means life eternal versus eternal death. And this Dr. Benson, he came out with books called, one first one was Relaxation. It's nothing but transcendental meditation with a changed name. It, ex, the medical society accepted it because it didn't have the names of the, of the occultic expressions. And so it became widespread. The armed forces used it for all their inductees and so forth of practice. But it's nothing but meditation in a form, actually hypnotism is what it amounts to. But he says, anybody that practices these eventually will pick up, or most of those will pick up the religion. And he's a Buddhist. So you can see that comment there. He wrote a book, The Relaxation. Then he wrote another one, Beyond Relaxation, 
And then he wrote something about the, the mind. The first one doesn't have any religion comments. The second one, I can see a little Buddhism in it. The third one, he just comes out and says, when you're relaxed, all the hypnotist has to do is tell you what to do. It's hypnotism, period. And he says so on that part. All right. This gets into the type of massage they do. And I'm going to skip through for time on some of these. But where we do massage certain points, something like acupuncture points, the Hindu says those areas, there's blocked energy. Well, here's a woodcut from back in the 1500s or so where they used to take a hot iron and put it on those spots and burn the people in those places. Actually, acupuncture started out as moxibustin, burning little weeds on a certain spot of the skin instead of a needle. And so we're, we're seeing the same sort of belief down through time, through the various civilizations change it a little bit. But the core of it is the same. Well, it skipped in th food there, it gets complicated and I didn't put much time. But they use the herbs to kind of have the external power of the cosmos connect with the, the cosmic power inside. That's what the herbs used as energy bridges between internal and external cosmic forces. Will not put much time. The essential oils, you hear a lot, and this is popular in our church for the women to get involved in essential oils. This is part of Hinduism that supposedly this spirit, this universal energy is in the plant, and by getting the essential oil, that's concentrating that energy and you're using that energy. That's what it involves. And the aroma is the same thing. It's a supposedly more common. Now, it doesn't mean that a nice ginger cracker, a ginger uh, smelling cooker, cookie is bad, uh, or the aromas of good tasting food and so forth, but using, taking these aromas and going and get those and using them for medicinals, they're not shown medically to be truly effective. Things may happen, and the books on them say, well, 20 years ago we didn't talk about the spiritual part. Now it's far enough along we can come out with the spiritual and get away with it. But that was what they, they would talk about, the physical aspects of it. Oh, it would be an antibiotic, it would do this, that, and the other. Really, their interest and their purpose, totally, to begin with, was spiritual. And that's a big one through our church. I've run into that, and it's a very difficult one. My book explains it far better than I even try to from here. Aromatherapy, similar. Okay. We, wanted, we talked about purification. Uh, let's get back here. It jumps to... All right. Purification, to bring balance, by irrigating the nasal passages, by promoting vomiting, by taking laxities and enemas and bloodletting. It's a way of purifying your sins in contrast to the shed blood of Christ. We're looking still at a, a substitute of God's plan of salvation, the counterfeit. And these are the types of things that come out. Remember when we got that energy up through the body to the head, it became the atonement. It's this, what Christ did on the cross now is represented as having moved the universal energy by meditation, yoga, up to the top chakra. Now over here, this is another component part. By cleaning these areas routinely, supposedly you're cleaning out impurities, and it's all a trek, a religious trek to nirvana, a part of that going to heaven, their heaven. So the nasal vomiting, let's look here. They'll irrigate every so often the nasal with certain substances that make the body pour out in copious amounts of mucus and what the body is trying to protect itself. Taking things to cause vomiting. These are routine practices, laxities. Medicated enemas and routine uh, enema for cleansing is very popular. Um, comes out of this concept. It's not needed. God gave us the skin, the kidneys, the liver, and the lungs to, to get rid of, excrete the impurities, go on a fast, drink a lot of water uh, for two or three days, or very little food. That'll be your cleansing way. Doesn't want to move. There we go. So then you put these enemas. Enemas have their place for the right problem, but not for these concepts. 
And here's a machine that will run the water through and out, and you can see through that plastic tube, that line across there, um, right here, you can see all it coats those impurities come out. And uh, it's amazing the beliefs that are there. All right, the urine therapy. Have you heard of this? This is part of Hinduism. And when we went back over to Russia in 1989, uh, 90, 90, 92, we found the believers there in the practice of drinking their morning urine to cleanse. And it comes out of Hinduism. When I was there, I asked the group I was speaking, I was there several times, but I asked one group, how many are doing it here? Nobody in the group. I was teaching this and then teaching health education. And one person, it had been two years since he had practiced it, and he, I said, well, why'd you stop? Well, I joined the church at that time, and he learned about it. But it's still a practice for the cleansing. And it, they're not Hindus there, but it somehow has worked its way over there. And this urine business, it's a sacred cleansing. Topical application? I was sitting on the platform in a big church in Moscow, and the pastor beside me trying to convince me that that was the way you dealt with skin in lesions and all sorts of things was apply urine. And he couldn't cons believe me that it wasn't really valuable. Drinking of it in the morning, urine enemas, urine injections into the body. Have you heard of the Ganges River? Yes, of course you've heard of the Ganges River. Uh, Dr. Manny Vasquez, American, uh, North American Division Vice President some years ago of the Adventist, went over to India and he was told by the priest there that the Ganges was the urine of Mother Earth. That's why it's so, so um, sacred on that part. I'm having trouble here, there we go. The peril of the theory of man's inherent power. If Satan can so befog and deceive the human mind as to lead mortals to think that there is an inherent power in themselves to accomplish great and good works, they cease to rely upon God to do them, for them that which they think there is power in themselves to do. And that one concludes that little presentation. And uh, I'll give you a, a break for a moment or two. Uh, five minutes always turn into 10 or 15. <laughs> but and if you've had enough, don't feel you're not going to offend me if you say, I've, I've had enough. I have one more that I will present, and it is more directly on the Chinese uh, on there. And uh, then we'll quit. I have 13 different presentations, but I don't intend to bring them all today. Just one more. And then we have, for those that stay to the end, I have something special for you. So let's take a moment, and you can get me the one number 